This message is produced by TruthFromGod.com, which is one of hundreds of messages that can be read, heard, and watched at TruthFromGod.com. Heaven Humbug It makes no difference what anyone's religion is. They all believe that heaven is a place where they go for eternity after death, they have some kind of concept as to what it will be. 99.9% .9 of all people not only believe in a God, but also that this deity dwells in heaven, and that if they conform to certain religious doctrines, then they will get to live there with him forever. Not caring one whit about religions whose holy book is not the Bible, I will only address the one called Christian, and everything that it teaches about heaven is a humbug. The dictionary defines humbug as something intended to delude or deceive. Although the English word heaven appears in the King James Version of the Bible over 700 times, the humbug is not what the sacred scriptures say, but it is what Christians continually profess heaven to be. And they are all mouthing only the spin of the church cocks. All Christians wallow in a hog pen of religious rhetoric designed to keep them in bondage to Christianism. No one in such captivity acts any differently than hogs who are content just to lay around in the pen without ever being aware of their slavish, stinking, slop-eating existence. Look at their lives, and a more pathetic sight will never be seen. There's no deliverance in repeating rituals, and counting beads, and attending services, in professing doxologies, or in performing any other good works set forth by their particular religious branding. All this is will worship according to the Bible and has no foundation in its sacred scriptures. Christianity has created a good news theology based upon a good cop, bad cop scenario. The bad cop is Lucifer in his hell and the good cop is God and his heaven. In this humbug, God will save everyone from Lucifer's hell if they are believers or acceptors of Jesus. And by the way, no one is a true believer if the edicts of the church are not rigorously followed. This is why the term true believer and true follower are the phraseologies of the clergy. Everything in this corruption called Christian demands obedience to the church with all its trappings, traditions, and theologies. This organization is proclaiming the good news, is instructing all mankind about God and is showing people how to be good. And the whole time it's being run by hypocrites, sexual perverts, child molesters, child rapists, adulterers, gays, charlatans, heretics, and ravenous creatures of every sort. How can this heinous, hellish hierarchy have complete control? Only by keeping the congregation captivated by fear that the bad cop is going to get them 
then the good cop will not be able to save them. Nothing in Christianism is based on the Bible, but is an outright satanic superstitious spiritualism. Is no thought ever given as to why this exalted ecclesia dresses in black, dons robes, or wears any adornment that gives them the infallible, imperial, intimidating image? Is there any understanding of Revelation 13.11 or the warnings of Matthew 7.15 and Acts 20.29? 20, no. These deceivers have a dress code which perpetrates the grand illusion of Christian piety. With impunity, the clerics ride high on the backs of a trembling, quivering, fearful, subservient, thoughtless, spiritless, powerless, helpless humanity. In dead earnestness, their mission is carried out to capture and enslave the minds of all mankind. They have been about their work for millenniums. Their devilish doctrines have been embraced as the oracles of God. This cankerous cancer thrives in the body of childish minds totally ignorant of Yahweh's principles and words. Only a Santa Claus mentality could ever embrace Christianism's perverted precepts of Lucifer, God, Heaven, and Hell. Isn't their God always making a list, checking it twice, gonna find out who's naughty and nice? Maybe it is all this list-keeping that causes God not to be able to control all things. He's just too busy with all his clerical duties to know what Lucifer's doing and where he's doing it. Even though God is their good cop, like any cop, he arrives on the scene only after the crime's been committed. He cannot prevent anything, but can only fill out the report. Yeah, and prayer is nothing more than a 911 call. Poor, pathetic Christians. Their God's too busy with all his bookkeeping to arrive in time. Their God's not in control of all things and is not all powerful. He cannot stop what Lucifer is doing or intrude on man's free will. Furthermore, their God is neither stud nor mare, but is some kind of impotent, castrated eunuch. Why? Because he cannot have a family of his own, but must adopt the devil's children. That is, if they accept or believe and follow what the church says. Now, who in their right mind would trust their eternal destiny to such impotency and ineffectiveness? And yet, this is the God Christianity is selling. The Christian's heaven is as absurd as their God. Their heavenly creation is one of eternal bliss where every acceptor or believer can have all the fleshly comforts they couldn't seem to acquire on earth. To them, it is a vast subdivision where Jesus is busy building mansions and paving golden streets. 
just ask them and they will all say this is true because Jesus is in heaven right now building me a mansion I wonder during all this construction if he has to wear a hard hat also if you get there before someone else then will you have to work on the construction crew or does Jesus have to do all this all by his lonesome <laughs> if this is not ridiculous enough they say there's a heavenly banking system question will the Jews run in like they do all the ones on earth in their twisted concept each person will have an account which holds all the riches they are amassing by doing a God's work and being good little girls and boys. Keeping these bank accounts up to date will require even more bookkeeping for God. So someone had better be doing his work on earth. Isn't it wonderful? <laughs> you can run down to the divine bank <laughs> and withdraw some of your riches anytime you need them. Uh-oh, wait a minute. Why would you need to do that? Are you going to have to buy things or maybe pay the staff that's taking care of that big mansion <laughs> in the sky? <laughs> By the way, don't forget about the yard crew, the cleaning crew, the laundry workers, and at least we forget the cooks and servers. Oh, no one will have to pay a chauffeur since everyone will be walking everywhere. And maybe this is okay since it will be on streets of gold. If there are any who doubt this Christian illusion, then read their chick publication entitled How to Get Rich. Never heard of it? Well, it is a booklet which is seen in all kinds of public facilities like hospitals. It has been placed there by Christians promoting their afterlife hocus pocus. The following is a direct quotation from it. Right now, Jesus is preparing for you a mansion up in heaven. Starting right now, all the good works you do for Christ, like helping others, will start putting riches in your new bank account in heaven. And one of your biggest benefits is you'll miss out on hell. This hell thing is addressed in the message, The Hell Hoax. It will not be taken up here, but it is the foundation upon which stands the need for heaven. Everyone runs to the good cop in fear of the bad cop. It is through fear of hell that the church's heaven is sold. Without hell, Christianity's good news would remain unsold at the newsstand. People have more important issues dominating their daily lives than taking time to read about some kind of Santa Claus. After all, they saw through this spoof by the first grade. Christianism must utilize fear tactics to scare people into getting with their program. Great revivals have always taken place after the populace is stirred into a hysterical frenzy. The government also knows how to play this game and through a propaganda-induced panic stampedes its citizens into running off to war in order to save the world. History clearly shows that when a black death arrives, 
The churches have a field day filling the ranks. Get a bunch of hellfire preaching, the roles of Christianity swell. People's fears motivate them to join up just in case. The old man said, I'm getting me some eternal fire insurance. The hard sale is not the joy of heaven, but the fear of hell. The dreaded horror of excommunication was not missing everlasting life in heaven, but being subjected to an eternity of torment in hell. Therefore, Christianity's God of love is a facade for its real God of vendetta. Yes, he will cook you endlessly for not following denominationalism's dictates. There's no way to escape this eternal pressure cooker without becoming a member of the faith. It is all up to the individual's choice and God has no say in the matter. If you want to get these soothsayers in a quandary, then ask them, who created hell? How could your God be a God of love and sit idly by while so much evil is going on in the world and then allow vast multitudes to languish in perpetual torture, burning for all eternity? Christianity has no answers. And it has adopted the same tactics as politicians who overpower you with empty and meaningless rhetoric. All this is a ploy to cover up the brutal fact that Christianism exists solely for the self-aggrandizement of the hierarchy and is built upon humanized theological traditionalism and not the word of Yahweh God. Further proof that Christianism has no knowledge of the scriptures will be seen by asking them, which heaven are you talking about? <laughs> You'll get a sideways look as if you just arrived from outer space. In their mind, only an insane heretic out to destroy the true way could conceive of such a question. Hey, in case you did not know it, this one ranks right up there with the most dreaded of all questions. That is, what is your God's name? To let these Christianites know that you are not going to let them off the hook with only their contemptuous look, you will have to say, hey, I'm not kidding. Which heaven are you talking about? No matter what they jabber. It will not be based upon the Bible. No scriptural citations will ever be given. It does not matter how far up the ecclesiastical echelon you go. You'll get nothing from the word of God. Yahweh's truth has no place in their organization built upon exploiting the soulish fear of men. All things having the name Christian swim in the same slimy sewage stinking cistern of strong delusion and are the antithesis of all sacred scriptures. Is everything they teach a lie? Yes. If a lie contains a little truth, if the truth contains a little lie, or if a little truth is omitted to give a distortion, then it is all a lie. 
it would be like saying someone is just a little bit pregnant. In court, the oath is to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth. See, I, like all flavors of Christianity, contains nothing that has not been adulterated and will hear the words. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity, Luke 13, 27 and Matthew 7, 23. They are serving up a blended potion that may smell good and taste good, but it is a terminal toxic tonic. Warning to all the Kool-Aid drinkers, there is no life containing in their convoluted, corrupted concoctions. The death angel dwells in their camp. Of the 436 times the English word heaven appears in the King James Version of the Old Testament, it is translated from the same Hebrew word Shamayim in all but three instances, which are in Psalm 77, 18, 89, 6, and 37. The first reference in the Bible to heaven is in, guess where, Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, God, Elohim, created the heaven, Shabayim, and the earth, Eretz, verse 5 says, This happened in the first day, Yom. There is another event in the next two verses, which concludes in verse 8 by saying, And God, Elohim, called the firmament heaven, Shabbatim, and the evening and morning were the second day, Yom. In only eight verses, two different creative days occurred, and in each there was a heaven created. More knowledge can be gained from Genesis 2-4, which is the first place in the Bible that the name of God occurs. These are the generations of heavens, Shabbatim, and of the earth, Eretz, when they were created. In the day, Yom, that the Lord, Yahweh, God, Elohim, made the earth, Eretz, and the heavens, Shabbatim, Exodus 20.11 says, For six days, Yom, the Lord, Yahweh, made heaven, Shabbatim, and earth, Eretz, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day, Yom. Wherefore, the Lord Yahweh blessed the Sabbath day, Yom, and hallowed it. A lot of Hebrew words have been used, but this is so that it can be seen that they are translated the same way in these verses. What can be understood from these verses? There is more than one heaven. Multiple heavens are also mentioned in the New Testament. One such reference is found in 2 Corinthians 12, 2. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. Whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such an one caught up to the third heaven never dealing with the truth of the scriptures. Christianity simply makes heaven a generic catch-all word and spins their humbug. 
They have their story and they're sticking to it. The followers of Christianism will demonstrate the statement, I've got my mind made up irregardless of the facts. All people that hope to take the heavenly flight better know which heaven you want to go to or else you may get on the wrong magic carpet. If you're going to fly away, then at least know to where you are flying. Just to be on the safe side, maybe you need to pray that someone like your priest, preacher, pastor, or church leader dies at the exact same moment you do, and then you can follow them to that glorious destination that they've been hyping. All the crap that church cocks have been shoveling out does not ring true in the deep down spirit of Yahweh's children Elohim. Why? Because if it did, why would they hold on to this life of sorrow and woe to the bitter end? and not opt out to leave earth now for the wonderfulness of heaven. This point's illustrated by the story of the old deacon nodding off during the sermon one Sunday. The minister, while preaching about heaven, told the congregation, everyone who wants to go to heaven, stand up. The deacon was roused by the noise of everyone getting up, and the preacher, seeing the old man still seated, asked him, Brother, don't you want to go to heaven? The deacon replied, Yes, sir, preacher, but I thought you were getting up a group to go today. <laughs> Imagine going into any church with a machine gun and asking how many of the faithful would like to die right now and go to heaven. <laughs> would there be any takers? Killing these people would be viewed by all Christianity as horrible and not a blessing. There would be a lot of weeping and no rejoicing. So their heaven does not ring true to them no matter what they profess. Fearful that their mindless followers may actually believe the heavenly delusion and check out early, thereby decreasing the size of the congregation along with its ties, the clergy developed a doctrine against suicide. It says, such an act is so bad that anyone who does it cannot be buried in hallowed ground and will not go to heaven immediately when they die. This also is more slop for the wallowing hogs. The endless modification of theology taking place in the church is like modern medicine. Doctors give a pill to alleviate a problem, but another pill has to be prescribed to offset the side effect of the first. It will not be long before the patient is on a dozen different medications. Treatment of one ailment fosters a legion of others. And the vicious cycle begins, which is extremely profitable for the whole medical industry, but is devastating for the patient. At least the doctors are honest enough to call their business a practice. Anyone who lets them practice on them had better be patient, for they're getting on a ride that they can never get off of. Jesus condemned the lawyer the doctors, and the clergy. Why? They all profit from people's misery and do whatever is required to perpetuate it. 
as shocking as it may sound, the whole purpose of Christianity is to enslave all people under its power. The church will do everything necessary to keep its followers coming back for another dose of the heavenly salvation elixir. The Christian humbug of believers, acceptors, and followers dying and going to heaven is never found in any of the 436 Old Testament verses. There's not one scripture or even an innuendo about heaven being a place where anyone goes when they die. But what about Elijah? Don't miss what is written in 2 Kings 2.11. Elijah was alive when he went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Oh, by the way, Elijah was not the only man that did not die. Genesis 5.24 says, And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. The New Testament elaborates on this in Hebrews 11, 5. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. Was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he please God. For all you Christianites who will not know where the book of Hebrews is in the Bible, it is in the New Testament after Philom and before James. Here's a little tip. When all else fails, open the front of your Bible and look in the index. I know this may seem to be a formidable task, since you probably will have to spend some time trying to find your Bible, but give it a shot anyway. While here it must be pointed out that another heresy, which is a fundamental principle of Christianism, comes from twisting Hebrews 9.27. This is how they pervert that verse. And as it is appointed unto all men once to live and then die, but after this the judgment. Now, open the Bible to this verse. You will see that this is not what it says. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. Irregardless of how you define men in this verse, would not Elijah and Enoch fit that definition? It is apparent that men does not mean all men, or that they live once, if you dare to know the scriptural truth pertaining to this matter, then go to my short message, The Thirteenth Step. Or, if you are really bold, start with Bible 101 and do all Thirteen Step messages in that order. If you're still game, then go to What is the Church, The Bride and Body of Christ, and Before Ending you will cross into a new frontier where Christianism's darkness is dispelled by Yahweh's light of living revelation. All these are short messages and quote an abundance of biblical scripture. Church Cox will now be in a frenzy, frothing at the mouth like some rabid animal over these issues. But heaven in the Old Testament is not where dead people go. Desperation, they will say, 
Well, we don't go by that Old Testament anyway. Just wait till they want to separate you from some of your money and see what scriptures they use to get you to tithe. When it comes to getting into your pocketbook, then the Old Testament's okay. Remember, this is the same sinister sidewinders that run the con game, good cop, bad cop. These New Testament tears will not like what it says either because nothing in it fits their social gospel. You know, the one that proclaims the universal fatherhood of God and brotherhood of man. What a joke. Because according to them, the devil has all the children that God is trying to adopt. If you're foggy about this, then go to the message, the adoption myth. That is, if you want to know the truth and are willing to spend a few minutes in the scriptures. All Christianity teaches that you are a child of the devil. And unless you become a believer, acceptor, and follower, then God will not be your father. Understand that this would limit who your brothers are also. Therefore, they teach the opposite of what they preach because God is not the father of all humanity, but the devil has his children, and all humanity are not brothers since some have one father while others have another. How ignorant are the adherents of such an illogical, irrational ideology? Totally. What can they see? Nothing. Only the power of Yahweh can bring light into such darkness. Give sight to the blind and deliver them from strong delusion. It is all up to him. And he will do it for those whom he has chosen and it will be done when he chooses. He is in control of all things, and he has chosen to bring you this far for a reason. The first place that the English word heaven appears in the King James Version of the New Testament is in Matthew 3.2. And it is translated from the Greek word uranios and is used 284 times. There is one time the English word heaven appears, which comes from the Greek word epiranius, and this is in Philippians 2.10. But in reality, this is is the same word, Uranus, with the preposition epi, meaning on, added as a prefix. Matthew 3 2 links heaven with kingdom, and the term kingdom of heaven is used many times in the New Testament. Even this kingdom of heaven is totally perverted by Christianism. That is another message for another time, but think about what Jesus, Yahweh says in Matthew eleven twelve, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. Does this violence take place in someone's heart? or in some spiritual realm called heaven, where they send all dead believers, acceptors, and followers. Earth is violent enough without going to some eternal place where violence still exists. Maybe 
this place after death is a happy hunting ground where anything or anyone is fair game. The Bible says in Revelation 12, 7 through 9, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Also notice the names of the great dragon, which was cast out into the earth. And Lucifer is not one of them. The Lucifer lie is also another message that will not be dealt with here. Even though this war in heaven is recorded in Revelation, it is about a past event according to Luke 10.18 where Jesus said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Not only is Satan the devil, in the earth, but also his flesh and blood offspring known as the Jews. Jesus tells the Jews in John 8, 44, the plain biological fact that ye Jews are of your father the devil. And, of course, the church cocks are always saying that the Jews are God's chosen people. And if this is not blasphemous enough, they even say that Jesus was a Jew. They call him a devil? Who is right, Jesus or Christianism? His words are theirs. Jesus, Yahweh Shua, was always saying things which sent everyone into a tailspin, and Matthew 18.18 is another example. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. The you and ye in this verse is not the priests, Pharisees, Sadducees, scribes, or any other church kikes. Actions on earth for these you and ye have the same action in heaven. This has nothing to do with what happens after someone dies. Perhaps the most devastating statement to all things Christian where Jesus, Yahweh says in John 3.13 And no man hath ascended up to heaven but he that came down from heaven even the Son of Man which is in heaven. Evidently there is a man that goes up to heaven. This could not pertain to Jesus since He had not been crucified or resurrected when he made this statement. Take a deep breath, for the man that came down from heaven is the Son of Man, which is in heaven. Don't hyperventilate, but in a calm, meditative, relaxed state. Think about what is being said, and pray that Yahweh Father has determined now is the time for you to receive revelation. In essence, Jesus, Yahweh Shua says, No man goes up to heaven except he came down from heaven whose dwelling is in heaven. Out of the mouth of Yahweh's anointed comes a cataclysmic, catastrophic collapse of Christians' heaven pie in the sky theology, which is all humbug. Nobody goes up to heaven. If this was not their dwelling, 
before coming down to earth. This is not based upon believing, accepting, or following anything, but is based entirely upon the place of origin. Yahweh's children, Elohim, were his in heaven and are his in earth. And they do go up and come down until they are perfected. This is what Jacob Israel saw in Genesis 28, 1 through 22. And it's what Jesus tells Nathaniel in John 1, 51. Perfection is another message for another time, but read John 17, 23. Ephesians 4, 12 through 13, Philippians 3, 12, Hebrews 2, 10, 5, 9, 6, 1, 12, 23, and 13, 21, James 4, and 1 Peter 5, 10. We are the heavenly family Elohim of Yahweh, no matter where our present dwelling is, Paul refers to this in Ephesians 3.15 when he speaks about the whole family in heaven and earth. The flesh-driven Christian organism views everything in such a perverted way that it actually believes and teaches that God lives in a house. According to them, this walled and roof dwelling of God exists in heaven. Jesus went up there in order to build even more houses for Christians. Totally ignorant of the scriptures, these Christianites do not have a clue that the Bible's talking about a household. When King David thought about building God a house, Yahweh told Nathan the prophet, Go and tell my servant David, Thus saith the Lord Yahweh, Shalt thou build me a house for me to dwell in? Also the Lord Yahweh telleth thee, David, That he will make thee an house, And thine house and thine kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. Therefore now let it please thee to bless the house of thy servant, that it may continue forever before thee. For thou, O Lord God Yahweh, hast spoken it, and with thy blessing let the house of thy servant be blessed forever. 2 Samuel 7, 5, 11, 16, and 29. In Matthew 15, 24, when Jesus said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He was not referring to a house that Jacob Israel had built, but was speaking about the household, racial family, descendants of Israel, who are not now or ever have been Jews. It is this meaning of house that Jesus is using in John 14 too, when he says, In my Father's house are many mansions, if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. The English word mansion is translated from the Greek word mone, which is used only twice in the ancient text of the Bible, and both occurrences are in this chapter of John. Weep and moan Christianism but this Greek word mone does not mean a four-walled, roofed building. And this is evident from the second time it is used, which is in John 14, 23. 
Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode, Monet, with him. This word means to abide, but the King Jamesers were not being consistent in the translation of the Greek word Monet. Why? Because it would have been ridiculous to render the verse, and we will come unto him and make our mansions, Monet, with him. Simply stated, Jesus told the disciples in my father's household are many abidings. And it is among this group that Jesus would prepare a place for them. The ordering, placing of Yahweh's children, Elohim, into the various stations in the body of administration, chain of command, is all that is taking place. There are no walls being raised or roofs attached to buildings by Jesus in heaven. The fact that there are no grand subdivisions under construction in heaven will come as a great disappointment to the flesh-driven mind which lusts for a real big house that fits its idea of a mansion. From the following verses, it is clear what is being built, and it has nothing to do with bricks, mortar, two-by-fours, roofing shingles, or any other such building materials. Here's another bubble buster. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we would have a building of God and house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. 2 Corinthians 5, 1 and 4. But Christ, being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. Hebrews 9, 11. Just as the earthy house is not made of brick and mortar, so also the house not made with hands eternal in the heavens is not made with brick and mortar. But we are that house, whether in earth or in heaven, with the evaporation of the grand retirement home concept. What about the big bank account full of riches and treasures? This faulty, fallacious fantasy is from twisting what Jesus said in Matthew 6, 20 through 21. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. These treasures and riches are not those dreamed of by a flesh-crazed mind. They're not things which are put into safes, vaults, or banks but are put into us, as stated in 2 Corinthians 4, 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God 
and not of us. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaketh. Luke 6, 45. Yahweh she was said in Revelation 3.18 I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with thy salve that thou mayest see. It is the anointed in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, Colossians 2, 3, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus, Ephesians 2, 7 and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he hath afore prepared unto glory. Romans 9, 23. The rewards of riches and treasures pertain to the heart, or tried in fire, or of wisdom, knowledge, and his grace and are in our earthen vessels. This will be a real bummer for Christians, but don't be totally devastated. At least you will not have to keep up with a savings account book. Eternal life has nothing to do with the Christian's heaven either. How this eternal life term got equated with dying and going to heaven is a mystery, since one of the Christianism's fundamental doctrines is that all humans have eternal life. Has this caught you off guard? Don't they teach that all people will be in either heaven or hell for all eternity? Therefore, the only question is, where will that eternal life be spent? If you want to know what eternal life is, then read John 17, 1 through 3. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son that thy Son also may glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Get a grip, for eternal life is knowing your father and big brother. It has nothing to do with believing, accepting, or following churchy doctrine, reciting some catechism, liturgy, doxology, are doing any one of a host of innumerable good works. The fatal wound to the Christian heaven humbug is that according to the Bible, heaven is not eternal. Now, before you flip out, read what Jesus Yahweh says about the last days. Matthew 24, 29, and 35. The stars shall fall from heaven, 
and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Heaven and earth shall pass away. Slice it and dice it any way you like, but heaven is no more eternal than earth. Lift up your eyes to the heavens and look upon the earth beneath. For the heavens shall vanish away like smoke. The earth shall wax old like a garment. And they that dwell therein shall die in like manner. But my salvation shall be forever. And my righteousness shall not be abolished. Isaiah 51, 6. Before passing out, realize that Yahweh makes a glorious promise. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. Isaiah 65, 17. For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, saith the Lord Yahweh, so shall your seed and your name remain. Isaiah 66, 22. This is reaffirmed in 2 Peter 3, 10 and 13, which says, the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. The ending of heaven must be seen in light of what was covered in the beginning of this message, which is that there are many heavens spoken of in the scriptures. There are those which are shaken, pass away, vanish away, and are made new. This new heaven will come down out of heaven as seen in Revelation 21, 1 through 2. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. The heaven that preexisted the one spoken of in Genesis 1 and 2 is the one from which the new heaven and earth descends. It is this one where the children, Elohim, were with the Father Yahweh before the foundation of the world. It is this one that Jesus, Yahweh Shua, is talking about in John 3.13 when he says that no one goes up to it except they came down from it and it is the place of their origin. So rejoice all Elohim and look up to that from whence ye came. For out of it will come a new heaven and a new earth, and there will be no more sea. Praise Yahweh your Father, for he is in control of all things. And the day is breaking when the former things are passed away. Lift up your heart for the old is dying and the new is coming to birth. This message is produced by truthfromgod.com which is one of hundreds of messages that can be read, heard, and watched at truthfromgod.com